This is CBC Here and Now. Striking out, the man at the center of the bowling pants controversy responds to his critics. Uh, it's very important that we, uh, we get this money into City Hall and we're doing everything we possibly can. St. John's attempts to collect millions in outstanding taxes. A small group owes big money. Foster care, why are so many Aboriginal children from Labrador in care in the Northern Peninsula? Relocation, residential schools, a lack of housing, uh, high unemployment within the community. Well, here we go. We've got round one rolling in as we speak through tonight with a messy mix of snow, ice pellets, freezing rain and rain. More of the same tomorrow and into Friday with a big storm brewing for the coast of Labrador. The details are coming up. Well, let's get to our top story. The head of Youth Bowl Canada in this province is speaking out today. Gord Davis says he followed the rules when he disqualified a team this past weekend for not following the dress, co dress code, and he's adamant he did nothing wrong. As we reported last Saturday, seven-year-old Grayson Powell from Kellegrews was bowling at St. Pat's Lanes in St. John's. He threw so well, his team won the Provincial B Tournament, but Grayson's father Todd Powell says his son didn't collect his gold medal because the team was disqualified by Gord Davis. The problem was Grayson's pants weren't black. Here's a quote from Gord Davis on Facebook. Mr. Todd Powell was fully aware of the dress code and sent his child to provincials knowing that it was against the rules. There was another bowler on the team also with gray pants on who knew it was against the rules but sent their child anyway. Gord Davis was not available for a television interview with us today, but Debbie will put some of his rebuttal to Todd Powell when he's live in our studio in 25 minutes. A small number of problem properties owe a big pile of cash to St. John's City Hall. That's money that could be used to provide services to people in the capital city. In total, there's more than $13 million in overdue property taxes. But a lot of that can be pinned on just a handful of accounts. Rob Antle breaks down the numbers in the CBC Investigates report. To get rid of the snow, dig up the streets, maintain water and sewer lines, and provide other services like Metrobus, the city needs tax dollars. The method of, uh, of collecting uh, is working. The city says most people and businesses pay their property taxes, a 97% compliance rate. But a CBC News investigation has found that a relatively small number of problem properties owe big bucks to City Hall. One residential property owner owes more than 700 grand in back taxes, another a quarter of a million. All told, 18 accounts are behind, more than $100,000 each. Many of these cases are very, um, very sensitive in nature, and uh, as a city we certainly recognize the impact that taxation can have on people. There are a series of escalating options for the city when people don't pay. Computerized notices, letters and phone calls, liens against properties, sending them to collections, the city can cut off water, although that rarely occurs. And then there's the legal route, tax sale auctions, the last one in 2015, and lawsuits, options not used much in recent years. It's very important that we, uh, we get this money into City Hall and we're doing everything we possibly can and certainly we'll be ramping up and intensifying some of the things, again being sensitive to uh, to the individuals we're dealing with. For months, the city wouldn't release any information about these tax debts. Earlier this year, the information commissioner said the data should be made public. City Hall finally agreed, and today announced a new policy. A summary of how much is owed in overdue taxes will now be published online. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. 
Trent Butt has pleaded not guilty to murdering his five-year-old daughter, Quinn. Butt entered the plea in Supreme Court in St. John's this morning. Andrea Goss, Quinn's mother, was in the courtroom surrounded by family and supporters. Butt also pleaded not guilty to arson. The police haven't said how the young girl died. Her body was removed from her father's burned-out home in Carboneer last April. The trial is expected to take six to eight weeks with up to 40 witnesses. It's slated to start with jury selection March 26th of next year, but it's possible the trial could start as early as this summer. And in another court case, a man pleaded guilty today to impaired driving, causing the death of an 83-year-old woman. The crash happened last July on a highway near Thorn Lee in Trinity Bay. Jay Newhook was traveling to the community to have supper with family and friends when her car collided with another vehicle. She died at the scene. 67-year-old George Whalem was charged with impaired driving causing death, driving while prohibited, and leaving the scene of an accident. He'll be back in court in mid-April. The retired judge hired as an independent observer of the RCMP's investigation of the Don Dumpy shooting was on the stand at the inquiry into the death today. Judge David Rich gave combative and colorful testimony. He's changed his position on one key point since writing his report more than a year ago. He now believes Dumpy never pointed a gun at Constable Joe Smythe, but instead raised a stick or club at Smythe before he was shot. Mr. Dunphy had his defensive club, I call it, to keep out intruders, and that was there by his chair. That was, and we've had a lot of evidence on that, too. And, it and was, was probably, and was probably the cause of him being shot. Well, coming up in just over half an hour, we'll hear more from Judge Rich's testimony today at the Dumpy Inquiry, including his response to criticism that he overstepped his bounds by drawing conclusions about Smythe. The man who wrote the report on last year's controversy involving the Spaniards Bay Volunteer Fire Department spoke to CBC Today. Retired RCMP officer Cliff Yetman wrote a 112-page report in which he concludes there is no evidence that any member of the department was subject to harassment. That's even though there were complaints of a pornographic film being shown at a training session and jokes made to firefighter Brenda Seymour that her male colleagues had masturbated on a balaclava that was part of her departmental clothing. Harassment is a, is a pattern of behavior rather than one incident. Now, one incident can constitute harassment, but, and I gave a couple of examples in the report of where a one incident uh, occurrence could constitute harassment. And that would be if, if, if someone was forced to watch or if, if there was an implication that by not watching, there would be a penalty by, by, by means of not passing the course. And, and there was nothing, there was no evidence of that. And uh, there was evidence that there was an apology given. And, and I concluded that, that it, on that basis, it, that particular incident was not harassment. And as far as the Spaniards Bay Fire Department, the, the, the video wasn't, wasn't even shown by uh, anyone from Spaniards Bay. Uh, it was an outside officer, a firefighter, who had been called in to do a course. And, and uh, he, he, he accepted responsibility for showing the video. And really, it had no... Uh, it had no bearing on Spaniards Bay at all. There's another example today of what not to do when you're behind the wheel. Brent Seward's dash cam caught this video yesterday morning, a vehicle speeding past a snowplow on a double solid line and on a turn. This is near Stephenville Crossing. Seward's message when he posted this to social media, slow down people, life is more important than work. We return now to our exclusive story on the Aboriginal foster children from Labrador. On yesterday's show, we told you about the large number of children who have been placed into care and the unique situation in non-Aboriginal communities like Roddickton and Anglee, where dozens of these children have been concentrated. Well, today we ask why Labrador children are so overrepresented in the child protection system and what is being done to address the issue. Here now is Terry Roberts joins us again tonight 
tonight with this report and a reminder that we cannot identify many of the people in this report because the law prevents us from doing so. The family in this living room know what it's like to be separated. For much of last year, the children were in foster care. It took months, but now the family is back together. What we had to go through, it was really, really hard. I mean, like, when we was home alone, me and my wife was just, like, wanted to hear our kids in the background playing in the rooms or... But no, we have that. We have it back, and we're pretty fulfilled from in our hearts just to hear all these again. The mother says losing her kids was a life-changing experience. I don't ever want to deal with that ever again because that was the hardest three and a half months. But not every family is that lucky. It's the middle of the school day and there's plenty of spirit and happy faces in the gymnasium at Jens Haven Memorial in Nain. Children being children. But there are some kids missing from this town, enough to fill nearly two classrooms. They're growing up hundreds of kilometers away in foster homes, in places like Roddington, being cared for by foster parents like Jane Smith. This is our world, our entire world. She's growing. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> she is a part of us. About 30% of the children in foster care in this province are Aboriginal children from Labrador. Yet the region has just 6% of the population. Why is this? Here's one answer. Labrador uh, faces a number of challenges, social challenges and demographic challenges, and we do have a significant number of Aboriginal children in care, just like the rest of Canada. But specifically, what are those social and demographic challenges? In Nain, the list of challenges is long. There's so many factors that um, have created the situation that we're in today. Uh, it's not, you just can't pinpoint it on one factor. You know, the social impacts that we have today is, is a result of other things that come into play. I, I mentioned, you know, uh, relocation, residential schools, the lack of housing, uh, high unemployment within the community. We, we're with 30% unemployment rate within in, in the community. So there's a lot of factors that come into play when when uh, when we look at, you know, some of the reasons why some of our children are being, you know, taken from uh, our communities and placed in, in foster homes elsewhere. With so many problems in Aboriginal communities, solutions are difficult. Governments and more money can only do so much. Sarah Leo was president of the Nunatsivut government until recently. She tried to solve this problem, but says Inuit parents themselves have to do more. There are other choices. Very simply, that the families can find a way themselves to be able to keep their children home. I mean, that's ultimately what it is, and that's a very strong statement. Being placed into care is a major change for the children. It's really frustrating to see these young families and their children are sent away to foster care and they're here living as if there's nothing going on. I'm sure they love their children, but they go and they can go and spend a week with them. They get a trip paid out by social services or CYFS or whoever to go and visit their children. They sit with them in a hotel room for a couple hours a day for the week they're there. They come back and they're back to their same lifestyle. This mother from Nain, seen here visiting her child in Roddington recently, agrees with Leo. She's given up drinking and is trying to get her life together. The parents need to... I just wish they could realize how much their children is important to them and I just want to stop. Like, it would be good to see all the children from Nain back home to just make all the families feel whole again. Because there's a critical shortage of suitable foster homes, many children are uprooted. About 100 are in care outside of Labrador. Given all this, is it a good strategy to relocate the children to the Northern Peninsula, away from their culture? It depends who you talk to. A lot of people think it's like, um, what do you call it? Residential school all over again and in a different form, but CYFS taking the kids out. I kind of feel the same way. Um, so do you think it's not justified? No, I think, I don't, it might be helping the children, I don't know, but it doesn't help the families back here. It, it's like tearing families apart. It's happened before. Residential schools, 
thousands of indigenous children taken from their homes in Labrador and across Canada. Class action lawsuits with courts condemning the practice, children losing their families, culture. But what other options exist? I would love to be able to keep children in their communities, with their families, with their aunts and their uncles if necessary, with their, you know, with their relatives. That, that's our number one, that's our objective and our goal. And I would love to be able to do that. But right now we have to remove children when we don't have the capacity to keep them in the community. Richard Pomock says part of the blame lies with the provincial government because not enough is being done to help families before a child is apprehended. He says the answer may lie in taking some control away from the province. We signed the land claims uh, just 11 years ago, and during that land claims, we, you know, is, is for us uh, the option of taking over services from the Newfoundland government. And hopefully one of, these, one of these services that we do take over is the protection of our children. Complex problems, no easy answers. The only certainty is that these vulnerable children need proper care the very foundation of any young life. This family in Nain has a new appreciation for that. They're just happy to be under the same roof again. It's good. I'm just happy that they're home. In Nain, I'm Terry Roberts. And reporter Terry Roberts joins us now. So Terry, we know there are more than 300 Aboriginal children from Labrador in some kind of care. Can you break it down further for us? Uh, yes, uh, Carolyn, I asked the Department of Children for the numbers, specific to the communities, and this is what they gave me. Just have a look at this. There are 40 children in care in Happy Valley Goose Bay for a population of more than 8,000. There are 31 children in care in Hopedale from a population of less than 600. In Nain, where I spent some time recently, 55 children are in foster care, most of them outside of Labrador. Now, in Nat Natwashish, there are 60 children in care, less than 1,000 residents. And the most serious situation seems to be in Shahashi, where there are 90 children in care. Now, that's a lot of broken families and a big challenge for social workers in the region. Children's Minister Sherry gambin Walsh said today that in Natwashish, the average caseload for a social worker is 37. That's well above the average. Wow. So, Terry, where do you go next with this story? Well, one of the outstanding questions now is, uh, you know, what's being done to help these foster children in Roddickton stay connected, really, with their Aboriginal culture and traditions? I'll have that story in the coming days. Thanks so much, Terry. That's here and now. It's Terry Roberts reporting live tonight. The province is bidding farewell to a longtime politician and former lieutenant governor. Uh, James McGraw died last night at the age of 85. And later, Justice Minister Andrew Parsons sits down for a one-on-one -on -one with Here and Now to talk about the controversy swirling around RNC officers. He answers the question, do you have full confidence in the Chief of Police?
Yeah. I think uh, at this time of the year, people are talking as much about potholes as they yeah. are about the weather. <laughs> True. It is a pain for sure. One of our social media colleagues, the CBC's Arianna yeah. Kelland, is trying to ease that pain and have a bit of fun too. Oh my goodness. Well, do you ever feel like you're playing Mario Kart navigating all those potholes? Imagine no more. Here it is. This is probably what it looks like. That's right. Uh, it's likely what of Mario would have had to deal with if he took his cart to the streets of St. John's. Uh, oh, there's a couple banana peels. I was just going to say I haven't seen any banana peels, but there they are. Uh, this is fantastic. That would be a lot more fun than actually driving in that vehicle. Yeah. I dodged the potholes myself today like yeah. everybody else around town. Oh my. And more up and down weather, which won't help the potholes over the next oh. couple of days. <laughs> Oh, that's Thanks. fantastic. Great Thanks work, to uh, Ariana for that. Nice. Now, much like Mario Kart, I'm going to be zooming through this forecast. Okay. Lots to get to. Let's show you. There's the big system rolling up through the Great Lakes. Again, two rounds working through. The one, it's already moving through as we speak. That's for tonight and Thursday. Round two comes in. That's the bulk of the precip you're seeing over the Great Lakes right now. That will be for Thursday afternoon and into Friday. And you can see where the snow already starting to mix with a bit of ice pellet and likely freezing rain action down that southwest coast as of 6, 630. Now with the mixing of the snow, the ice pellets, the freezing rain, the rain, then back to freezing temperatures tomorrow. That's prompted special weather statements for central western Newfoundland. The rainfall warnings for the southwest coast. 20 to 30 millimeters there, all snow for the, uh, for the northern peninsula and hence the blowing snow advisory there. These are totals for tonight and into tomorrow morning. So this is basically round one. And again, the bulk of the snow for the northern peninsula, central Newfoundland with that messy mix, St. John's and the northeast coast, a bit of uh, some snow through tonight, a couple of centimeters possible, but mainly a rain event with 5 to 10 millimeters. Watch your timeline here. This is as of 9 p.m. Already starting to see that mixing working up into the eastern parts of Newfoundland as well. The periods of rain will continue as we roll through the overnight hours for areas south of the northern peninsula. And the rain will come down at times a little on the steady side. Now, by the time we get to tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., plus side temperatures for most of us. Uh, the west coast will dip back down below freezing for Corner Brook and into the Deer Lake Humber Valley region as well as the Baver Peninsula and then eventually into the Grand Falls Windsor region as well. And this will set up the freezing rain event uh, and ice pellets mixing in for tomorrow afternoon that could stretch out towards the Gander region as well. We're going to continue to say showers, drizzle, even some periods of rain right through the day for the southeast, including the Buren and the Avalon Peninsulas. And again, this is round two, which will then roll in as we roll through Thursday afternoon, Thursday night, and in through the day on Friday. And in fact, this storm will wind up into the Labrador Sea, sit and stall. And this is a classic two, three day event for the coast of Labrador, where we are talking about big time totals. 50 centimeters or more looking pretty likely now by the time we get through the weekend. Now this is only as of Thursday morning to Friday morning and then just that 24 hour time. I think we're likely to see some 20 to 30 centimeter amounts here from the Mary's Harbor region up into the Cartwright region. And again, additional snowfall likely here by the time uh, for sure when we roll through Friday, Saturday and into Sunday. Again, much of the island will be seeing that messy mix uh, for the, uh, the afternoon tomorrow into tomorrow night, but it's mainly rain for the southeast, though we will see that mix back to flurry. So with that Labrador piece of the storm coming in, and that second wave, we do have winter storm warnings in effect for the northern peninsula, southeastern Labrador winter storm watches, blowing snow advisories, and special weather statements for Happy Valley Goose Bay and the north coast. Quick recap, your drive to work tomorrow, this is what it looks like. Showers for most of us, including the Cornerbrook region, but that will mix back to some ice pellets and freezing rain through the morning. We are looking at that snow for the northern peninsula. And again, those mild temps, a quiet start in Labrador. Your drive home tomorrow, this is where we're looking at that ice returning for central, back towards the Cornerbrook region. Showers continue in the south and east, including the Avalon. That snow for the northern peninsula and uh, some lighter snow pushing up towards Happy Valley Goose Bay. We'll talk about the weekend, and uh, there's lots to talk about there coming up a little bit later on. Thanks, Ryan. A Newfoundland and Labrador will once again have representation on Canada's national women's team, thanks to Sarah Davis. 
This is the third consecutive year Davis has made it to the national team. She's 24 years old and her hometown of Paradise has already named a street after her. Davis previously played with the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers before joining the Calgary Inferno as part of the Canadian Women's Hockey League. The 23 players that make up Team Canada will compete at the 2017 Ice Hockey Women's World Championship in Michigan at the end of the month. Former Lieutenant Governor and longtime politician James McGraw has died at the age of 85. He was Minister of Fisheries in the government of Prime Minister Joe Clark when fellow Newfoundlander John Crosby was Minister of Finance. The fish and chip kids. <laughs> I've got the fish, he's got the chips. <laughs> My friends, for Newfoundland, how sweet it is. But things didn't remain sweet for long as Premier Brian Peckford battled Ottawa for control of the fishery. But the fact is that I was in Ottawa fighting for the fisheries when a great many of our present political leaders were still schoolboys. After detailing his concerns... McGraw his served as Lieutenant Governor between 1986 and 1991 and was first elected as the PC Member of Parliament for St. John's East in 1957. He was born in Buckins and was a volunteer during the referendum the on whether Newfoundland should join Canada in 1948. ...is to accept the... Bowling clothing controversy is turning into a he said, he said argument. The father, who first raised concerns about the way he feels his son was treated at a weekend tournament, is in studio for the latest.
Welcome back and back now to our top story. A dress code infraction got a seven-year-old boy and his team disqualified from a bowling tournament after they'd won gold. Gold, rather. The boy's father, Todd Powell, went public with his anger, especially at Gord Davis, the provincial head of Youth Bowling Canada, and the story just took off. Now, Davis wasn't available for a television interview, but Todd Powell joins me now. Thanks very much for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me, Debbie. Uh, Gord Davis had a whole lot to say on Facebook. Um, he says you knew about the dress code rules. You ignored them anyway. But I understand the two of you have spoken today. We, How did that go? We did speak, I did speak to her today and at the end, at the outcome is we want to make sure this is a positive outcome for all kids that are involved and all kids in youth bowling. So me and Gord, uh, we had a conversation. He's, he's informed me that he's going to re not reverse his decision, but he's going to give back, uh, make it, have a ceremony for these kids and present them with the gold medals. The issue right from the get-go, Debbie, was, it wasn't about uh, who won or how it took place is how how it went on and how it was delivered to the kids and the people that were at the bowling lanes. You know the kids bowled really hard. They they wanted they worked really hard. They got they knew they won, but then they were waiting for the medals and then be told it was qualified. You don't do that to youth sports and amateur sports. So the reason why I went out on the social media is trying to make this right so it doesn't happen in the future to kids. Well, I just want to uh, just on the point that uh, the way it. The way this happened, uh, Gord Davis says uh, that your coach knew about this problem during the very, very first game of the tournament. And I just want to uh, read a post, uh, yep. read his comment from the post. Uh, and he says, the program director, and I think we can bring it up here on the screen, the program director, the coach, should be advised, the parents uh, should have advised the parents during the first game when I advised her that there could be repercussions from not following the rules. Well, what do you say to that? Well, uh, I, what I can say to that is that was not uh, communicated to any of the parents of uh, the three bowlers right. prior to uh, during that. It was you only communicated when the tournament was over, the kids were on the floor waiting to get a medal, and the parents, three parents, were, were brought into a room and said, unfortunately, a rule has been violated. We had to disqualify this team, therefore they're, they're not entitled to the provincial tournament or a medal. The frustration came in again was is how it was done. Yes, there was some miscommunication and, and through the process and all that, but it should have been dealt with right at the get-go. If they're going to put a rule in place and enforce it, make sure every kid is checked prior. I know it's busy and they've got kids going around the world, but we really need to make sure this doesn't happen again in the future. Uh, Gore Davis wants an apology from you. Are you prepared to give one for the way uh, you spoke and were angry? What do you have to say I won't to that give an request? I won't give an apology for the methods I took and went to social media. I will offer Gord an apology for his comments I made about his business and how I thought that it was he was making decisions for his business. I do apologize to Gore for that, and I hope he accepts my apology, but I won't offer an apology for what I did to try and make, the, make this right again for those kids. Uh, Todd, are you satisfied with the way it now seems to be concluding? That you had this uh, conversation with Gord, that the team is going to get some medals. I is this enough for you now? I'm satisfied. I think it's going to be a big learning curve for Newfoundland Labrador Bowling Association and for the parents and for myself to involve. So on a go-for basis, this won't happen again to any children in youth amateur sports and in this sport bowling. So it, on a go-for basis, I'm pretty confident this won't happen again because they, you know, I mean, they, I'm not saying they dropped the ball, but I think they're aware of the situation that came out. They don't want to go through this again. Mm -hmm. And um, this this story picked up so much traction. Is that why you kept pushing so that you can affect some change? You don't want to see this happen again. And when I say the story had traction, you just finished an interview with Washington Post. Yes, I did. So is that what kept driving you, that you wanted everybody to know the situation? Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't about to tear up the sport. I'm not about tearing up the sport for, for this. It's about the kids. Make sure it's done right right in the future so no kid goes home upset crying because a medal they know how well they bowled and a medal being taken away from them, right under their noses so this is on a go for basis so it doesn't happen again to another child I just want to finally ask you about your son Grayson uh, are you at all worried about the impact that this whole situation has had on him or how is he holding up 
Grayson, Grayson's a, a seven-year-old boy. He, he plays multi-sports. He, he understands what happened, but he, he, he's a typical seven-year-old boy. The next day, he was happy-go-lucky. He knows he bowled well. We told him he bowled well, and we did get some support from family and reached out to him and told him he bowled well. But he's doing okay. He'll be, he'll be fine, and I'm, sure, I'm hoping YBC will welcome him back. In, into the bowling league next right. week. I think everybody will be happy to hear that Grayson is doing okay. And Todd, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me, Debbie. We asked the Justice Minister for his thoughts on all the controversies dogging RNC officers in recent years. Stay tuned for Andrew Parsons' response. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary has had a lot to answer for in the past couple of years. There's an external investigation into the RNC's handling of a criminal informant. Constable Joe Smythe shot and killed Don Dumphy, and now there's a judici judicial inquiry questioning his actions and the actions of investigators. Plus, we're in the midst of a public uproar over the trial of RNC officer Doug Snellgrove, who was found not guilty of sexual assault. So today, we spoke with Justice Minister Andrew Parsons to find out what can be done to restore public confidence in the police. So Minister, I guess it's safe to say that it's a fairly tough time for the RNC right now. They've been taking hit after hit. A lot is going on. A lot has been happening. Is all of this normal? Well, I, I certainly don't think I would call it normal. And uh, it's been a lot. Yeah, when you when you come in and take over this position and these are the issues that are there waiting for you that have been sitting there, it's unfortunate. And it's especially unfortunate because, you know, when you think about policing, one of the primary aspects is, is public confidence. When you think about justice, it's public confidence. And uh, you know, when things like this happen, it, it does cause people to, to ask questions and to, and to maybe waver in that confidence. But, uh, you know, I, I'm confident that, you know, this is why we've taken the action that we have when you think about the inquiry. I mean, that was an action taken to in inspire public confidence when we, when we you know, do investigations into allegations. That's why you do it. It's better to do that and, and to get the answers. Uh, and you know, other things that we've done too, I think in our system right now, like, uh, like the civilian oversight of police are things that we're doing. But uh, the underlying thing that I would say is that you know, these I think are isolated incidents. And I have total confidence in the men and women that are doing this work. It's an extremely tough job being on the front line. 
and I, I think that they do great work. And uh, you know, just because we've had uh, isolated incidents involving you know a few people, that shouldn't certainly tar the actions, the great actions of the many. But you don't often see you know, protests on the steps of RNC headquarters. You don't often see graffiti in downtown St. John's targeting the RNC and a specific officer. Do you think, you know, taking all of those things into consideration, plus the investigations and the inquiries and the trials, is the RNC going through a crisis of confidence? Well, you know, it's certainly a tough time for them, and that's where the RNC is. They have to show leadership here, and, and you're right. I mean, when you have protests, uh, regarding the actions there uh, of of a police force, yeah, they, we have to take notice. I mean, I can't sit here and see that happening and think that this is just run of the mill. No, this this is important that we we listen and we we learn from this. But again, I my big thing is that you know, I fully support protest. I fully support asking questions, but I don't support uh, you know pegging everybody as being afflicted by what I think is in this case is the actions of really when we're talking about that this most recent case was one person mm -hmm. and you know uh, and that's going to be dealt with and it has to be dealt with and that's again this is a matter that it falls within the, the the chief and the management of the rnc and there is process that has to be followed it's hard to speak about the specifics there's an appeal process in the court that's still open there's a disciplinary employment side of that those are open so i can't comment but i think the public is watching very carefully to see what uh, what does transpire it's not over yet either. We have the chief is going to be on the stand at the inquiry today. We still have that cert report to come, uh, and we also have Commissioner Leo Berry's uh, report to come. So we still don't know what more we're going to learn. How concerned are you about all of these issues going forward? There is a lot coming up, and all I can do is to to make sure that we to, we listen to what comes out because there's no point you know when you hold an inquiry. The whole purpose in my mind is twofold. A, to get the facts of what happened, and B, to get recommendations to prevent that from happening again, because that's what we need again to ensure public confidence and to ensure the administration of justice. That's my job. My job is to give people the time to do the work, such as the, you know, the dump inquiry. And I'm, I'm quite pleased with the progress that you know Justice Barry and his team are making. They, they've taken this on, they've, they've, they're working fast. It's, you know, it's a big process and I fully expect to have a report by July 1st. When I get that then I'll be able to add, you know, figure out what are the next steps that we have to take uh, going forward. But keeping top of mind that this system is created to ensure confidence and the steps that I take always had to be maintained to, to maintain that confidence. And that's the thing that guides me every day I walk in here. And uh, that's sort of the top of mind principle. Do you have confidence in Chief Bill Janes and the leadership at the RNC? Yes, I have confidence in Chief Janes and the team around him and all the men and women that work in the RNC. I'm not going to allow, uh, again, the actions of one to color the entire force. There's uh, a process in place that has to be followed. And I am looking forward to that process being followed in a very timely fashion to ensure that everything is done properly. And again, the way this works is that you know any of us in leadership positions have to show leadership. So again, no matter if it's Chief James or the head of our RCMP or the superintendent of our prisons, they are in leadership positions and they need to show leadership. And that's what I expect of everybody in this department every day. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Somebody said here at this desk that spring had started today. It's a bit <laughs> early, isn't it? Meteorological <laughs> spring it, oh? it began today, which is March, April, and May. And I know, I know, Newfoundland and Labrador spring, if we have one at all, is a very gradual, slow process, but I truly believe one of the only ways to get through that long process is to have optimism, some positivity. <laughs> I like it. And we can start that right now by looking at some of the facts of March. And in fact, I just posted on cbc.ca slash nl 10 reasons why we should be optimistic about flipping the calendar over to March. And this is just one of them the sunrise and sunset times. Look at the sunrise times and sunset times at March 1st compared to March 31st. Now, of course, wow. we do have a, a spring forward clock change in 11 days. 
That's also one of the top 10 reasons that we should uh, listen, uh, be excited about March. But look at the sunset times, 8.01 p.m. in Labrador City by the end of March. Now, if that doesn't bring a smile to your face, I don't know what will. <laughs> uh, so you can check that out, cbc.ca slash NL. It's, uh, I believe, number three on the page right now. And also cbc.ca slash Ryan Snodden. I've got it posted there. I'll post it to my Facebook page uh, later on this evening as well. Okay, so yes, it's meteorological spring, but again, a gradual process. And uh, certainly this uh, wintry mix that's rolling in right now is very spring-like, in fact, because we are looking at that change over to rain for many tonight. Again, it's round two where we have the warnings, newly uh, issued warnings in place for Labrador and the Northern Peninsula. Winter storm warnings and watches, as well as special weather statements and blowing snow advisories. This is where uh, we'll really start to see that snow ramping up through Friday into the weekend. These are totals for tomorrow and into the day on into Friday morning, that is. So it doesn't include Friday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday where the snow will continue to rack up along the coast of Labrador. But by, by Friday morning, you can see where it again it is mainly showers for the southeast half of the island, a messy mix in central. And that's what I'm most concerned about for tomorrow for the drive home from Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor to Cornerbrook will be that ice pellet freezing rain mix. We're looking at that snow returning for the northern peninsula. It'll be just showers, drizzle and fog patches to contend with for the Avalon and the Buren Peninsula. So we'll pick things up for your drive home tomorrow and note that messy mix will linger into the evening. We'll see some showers continuing periods of drizzle. By the time we get to Friday, it's a mix back to flurries along the island and we are looking Looking at onshore flurries and even some squalls developing along the west coast, some very strong winds through the day on Friday, howling gusts in the 80, 90, even 100 kilometer per hour range. And we are looking at those strong winds really ramping up through Friday in Labrador. Again, minus 12 periods of snow and blowing snow. Those onshore flurries for the west and temperatures again tumbling. And certainly over the next couple of days, as that low cranks up in the Labrador Sea and the cold air wraps around that system, it's going to be a more winter like weekend than spring. No question. Those temperatures falling minus four to minus 10 across the island, minus 12 to 20 in Labrador. Uh, and those flurries will linger Sunday and into Monday as well with a bit of a clear out for Tuesday and into Wednesday. Labrador again, snow and blow all week and long in the east. OK, today's young athlete of the day loves all things hockey. Six year old Joey Windsor's from Conception Bay South. Yes, he's in his third year of squirts and now plays with the Renegades. Good luck this season, Joey. You're today's young athlete of the day. I want to uh, tell my account. The retired judge who acted as an independent observer into the RCMP shooting death of Don Dumphy testified today. You'll hear what he had to say coming up next.
Welcome back to Here and Now. And we return now to the testimony of Justice David Rich at the Dunphy Inquiry today. Rich was hired as an independent observer of the RCMP's investigation of the Don Dunphy shooting. In this exchange with Commission co-counsel Kate O'Brien, Rich explains why he came to the conclusions he did regarding the death of Dunphy. Based on facts that I found from the material they gave me, I came to certain conclusions. I understand that, and I understand that's here. We've had some... They didn't like. Ryan, what's your question? We've had some evidence from RCMP officers that, that, they, that they felt by making conclusions and interpretations on the evidence that that was outside of your terms of reference. Would you agree with them or disagree with them? Well, I felt that it was important for me to get to the, at the truth and to find out. I wanted to know what happened. Okay. But did you see that at the time as going beyond no. what was in your terms of reference? No. I did have one meeting, which I should be allowed to explain to you. Uh, I asked about certain things, you know. How come you didn't do a polygraph on uh, Smythe? Oh, no, we couldn't do that. But they didn't tell me why. You know, this was a terrible thing, and uh, this whole event. And I really felt bad about the thing. And I said, so at the meeting, I said, look, why didn't the policeman come? I didn't know anything about this tweet thing. I'll tell you about this tweet thing. I thought it was, uh, was something funny. But anyway, <laughs> this, uh, this the tweet thing, uh, I say to them at the meeting, well, I said, why didn't the police officer, why didn't he come in? And if he got into the house somehow, why did, didn't, if, if, if there was some criminal going on here, why didn't they just put the cuffs on Dunphy and bring him in? Okay. And bring him before a judge, okay. so, so a judge could hear whether or not he'd been guilty of an offense. Now, what did they say? And this is what triggered, this is what gave me the information. Oh, we could, that couldn't be done. Why couldn't it be done? He'd be up for false arrest. Okay. So I said to myself, I suppose I was allowed to think, if he uh, could say, well, false arrest, if it was false arrest, what was he doing there anyway? And we have heard uh, testimony on that, and we've heard testimony that uh, that uh, Constable Smythe didn't believe that he had reasonable and probable grounds to make an arrest. On now, that if, he, if he had grounds to make an arrest, uh, but uh, these three uh, RCMP officers basically said, no, you can't, you can't go and arrest him. False arrest. Yes, you need reasonable and probable grounds to arrest, isn't so, that right? So then, I, I concluded, I concluded that Smite shouldn't have been there at all. He starts drinking again. He's not going to start drinking again. How do you know that? I just know. A movie filmed in St. John's is premiering in the city tonight. We'll tell you when and where you can see Away From Everywhere.
This is an exciting evening for the film industry in St. John's. They'll get to see the fruits of their labor on the big screen at the Avalon Mall. Memories fade in and out like damaged frames of celluloid. What if he starts drinking again? He's not gonna start drinking again. How do you know that? I just know. Help me help my brother. What's up? Something we need to discuss. Away From Everywhere is premiering tonight. The film is based on Chad Pelley's award-winning novel and it was directed by Justin Sims. It stars Hollywood actor Jason Priestley along with a local cast that includes Sean Doyle and Joanne Kelly. The movie is about a struggling writer who emerges from rehab and reunites with his estranged brother. It's premiering in St. John's at the Scotiabank Theatre tonight and it'll play on in Ottawa Friday night. And Toronto on Saturday night. Well, just check out this incredible video. So this is not a scene out of an action movie. This dramatic crash capped off a high-speed police chase in Louisiana. Police were pursuing an escaped inmate who had stolen this truck and he hit some spike strips, lost control, and then launched the truck into the air and onto its roof. Oh my. The 18-year-old was taken back into custody. Whoever was filming that video is very lucky. Absolutely. Yeah, too close for comfort. Way yeah. too close for comfort and unreal that uh, the driver of that vehicle survived that. Uh, top 10 reasons why we should be excited for March. One of them, the rising sun angle. We'll leave you with this. You can see that our sun angle, 35 degrees altitude now on our way to 66 peaking in June, but we've come a long way since December 21st. It's getting higher and stronger. Yay. Wonderful. Great news. Reason to celebrate, <laughs> and I'd say. And it did feel very spring-like today. The sun felt warm, it was cold out, but no wind, so it was pretty nice. Pretty nice. For coming. a meteorological <laughs> spring. You got it. <laughs> See y'all tomorrow. Yeah, Good night. Don't want to say that five times.